Hello, hello. You guys can take a seat. You can take a seat. Make some noise if you're thankful to be in God's house this morning. Come on. What an honor to be here with you. Uh, my name is Hi King. Uh, you spell that H-Y-K-E-N-G. That is my real name. Uh, I often joke with folks and tell them my, my true name is Hi Kingdom Come, Your Will Be Done. Uh, that is a joke. But uh, my last name is Paul. It's very easy to remember. But I, I bring greetings to you this morning from New Spring Church and on behalf of, of my family. And so it is an honor for me to be with you. My family is seated right over here. My kids are kind of taking it all in because they're used to kids' church at New Spring. Uh, but I want to show you a, a photo here on the screen, if, if you don't mind, if you guys have that. Um, this is my beautiful bride, Kareen. Uh, we actually just celebrated 10 years of marriage a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> And uh, we are similar to studio. We like to be fruitful and multiply. And they, these are our, our two children. That's my son in the middle. His name is Elijah. He goes by Prince. Uh, and that's my baby girl, Ava, that sits there. She's very much like me. So uh, if you don't mind, pray for me, okay? Uh, I could use all the prayers. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, but I also, before I get into the word, I just want to give honor to your pastors here. Uh, you have some amazing pastors in Pastor Eric and uh, Candace. You guys are such a, uh, a blessing to not only us at New Spring, but the community of Greenville. Uh, I was telling them this earlier that, you know, if you're a part of a church for a while, some folks deal with some church hurt. You know what I'm saying? And so over the years of being at New Spring Church, I've had several friends who have been hurt within the church, but they found healing at this church. And so I say that to uh, be a blessing to you and also to your pastors. If you don't mind, give them a round of applause and give thanks to God for them. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, now, uh, I also would say this before we get into the word. I don't know if you guys recognize, but I am an African-American, okay? Um, in the church that I grew up in, everyone looked like me, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I, I preface with that because as I preach, uh, I expect for you to talk back to me a little bit. So uh, here in the South, most so I, I got a sister over here already, shot me down. Uh, but I also know that if you are from the South, which most of the folks from studio are not, okay? Uh, but most white people from the South just sit up straight and quiet while the preacher's talking. I'm just saying, talk back to me, okay? Because if you're quiet, I think I'm doing a terrible job. That's all. All right. So if you have your Bible, if you have your scriptures, I'm going to invite you to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Second Corinthians 5. Excited to read this in your hearing this morning and believe that God has some things that he wants to say to us. 2 Corinthians 5. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm, ready. I'm assuming y'all used your cell phones and not your actual Bibles, because y'all got there pretty quick. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing. My man held up his Bible. He said, hey, I'm analog. I got it. I love you, brother. 2 Corinthians 5. We're going to start in verse 14 and go through 21. Here's what the text says. <clears throat> this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the church. For the love of Christ controls us, 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 because we have concluded this, that one has died for all. Everyone say all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 
I would love to tag this text in your hearing this morning. Enough is enough. I'm going to say it again. Enough is enough. Can we pray? Abba Father, you are good. And God, we know of your goodness because of your one and only son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you came, you lived, you died, and you resurrected to give us new life. And you said that I will not leave you as orphans. I call you my friends. Why? Because you have given us your promised Holy Spirit that lives within us. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you into this space. I ask that your manifest presence will be made known to us. Reveal more of Jesus to us. Empower us by you. We love you, and we trust you. And we pray all of this in God's name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Enough is enough. It was a few years ago that I was on the phone with my parents. And this phone call turned from a phone call to a FaceTime. Because grandparents know you don't want to see your kids. You want to see the grandkids. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're a parent in the room, you know this. Your parents don't really care about you anymore. The things that... The discipline that they gave you, they don't give to your kids, and it doesn't make sense. But on this particular day, I was on the FaceTime with my parents, and we're having conversation and talking a little bit about something that was happening in in my home. And specifically on this day, just talking about my son and how he kind of reminded me of my, or really, he didn't remind me of myself, but uh, my wife and I, we don't really argue. I just got to be honest. We give each other the silent treatment. You know what I'm saying? Like the married couples, you know this. If you're not married yet, just wait. It's coming, okay? Um, we don't really argue. We don't raise our voices to each other. We just give each other the silent treatment. And what I've recognized is whenever I give my wife the silent treatment or she gives it to me, it's oftentimes her giving it to me. Let's just be honest. I would just start to, to notice that my son would come and just sit in our midst, not saying a word. It's as if he just wants to say to us, I'm here, I recognize there's something off. And my presence is to tell you that y'all gotta get something together. You know what I'm saying? Y'all have ever experienced that? Well, I'm telling my family this on the phone, my parents, and my dad said, yeah, it used to do the exact same thing. He said, when you were a child, your mother and I, whenever we would get into an argument, you would always find yourself in the middle And you would always say, enough is enough. Because there was something about their division that I saw and experienced. And I said, hey, I can't have that anymore. Enough is enough. I've seen the photos of you two together 20 plus years ago. I've seen the love that you two talk about. And now I'm experiencing this friction between each other. And I can't have that. Enough is enough. But the reality is it's often, it's easy for us to find division. It's not very, very easy for us to find reconciliation. Am I right? Division is everywhere. I mean, we divide over the smallest things. I mean, some of us divide over cats and dogs and I don't like either. I'm just gonna be honest. Other times we divide over coffee or tea. Where are my coffee drinkers in the room? Come on by show. Okay, we even got a shout. Okay, what, what about the tea drinkers in the room? Okay, okay, all right. We, we divide over, uh, you know, is it DC or Marvel? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's the small, whoa, I didn't mean to. <laughs> that just got, that got rowdy real quick, you know? Well, if you're a married couple, you also know that sometimes you fight over the little things like the tooth, toothpaste. I mean, my wife, she talks about the tube. You got to squeeze the toothpaste from the top or I squeeze it from the top. She says, you got to squeeze it from the bottom. And that's why we don't have enough anymore, because you squeeze it from the top. My bad. <laughs> you know, sometimes we fight over things like the toilet paper. Is it over or is it under? I mean, my over people, you know, my, my wife convinced me, all right? Before we got married, it was under. But why do I bring this up? We talk about enough is enough, and we need reconciliation in our world. But how many of you know that reconciliation has become a polarizing word in our culture? that we talk about reconciliation as if it's one thing, and oftentimes that's tied to something called race. And it's caused so much division that even when we read it in scripture, we kind of tense up because it's like, I don't know what this guy is about to say. 
Are you going to tell me as, uh, as a, a majority of folks who are white and in the South, are you going to tell me that I'm doing something wrong because you're an African-American? No, 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 no. That's the political stuff. That's the, the ways of the world. So the reality is, in order for us to define reconciliation, we must let the Bible define it instead of the culture. Because if we don't, what we will not have is actual reconciliation. What we will have is more division. Because what many people in our culture want to do is define things based on their experience and what they think is right, rather than allowing the scripture, Almighty God, define what it actually means. So what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is simply this. There is a division. There is something that has been wrong between two separate parties. And what reconciliation does is bring those th two things that were separated together as one in friendship. That's what reconciliation is. It's as simple as that. The two separate things that are divided have now come together as one. So what do you mean? Let's just be honest. Even if you move from the north to the south, you experience some of that division. <laughs> This is what my wife experienced when she came from Ohio to South Carolina. I just don't feel like I can fit in with the women of the South. Like, you got to wear a dress. You got to talk a certain type of way. I just don't get it. Like, I, I want to fit in, but I feel so divided. Right? Some of you came from the West Coast to the East Coast. You thought you had it good on the West Coast, and then you get here, and, I mean, you get all the, you know, good food, but at the same time, a little bit of country slang. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Like, I don't understand what these people are talking about. That's what Dee was saying earlier. I'm like, yeah, bless your heart. She's, you know, that's our other saying. But let's just be honest. There's a division between not just, um, you know, re regionally. There's division among race. Can I say that in the church? Can I just be honest? This isn't just a, a black and white issue. It was historically, but turn on the TV. Do we not see what's happening in the Middle East? Do we not know what has happened and is still happening in the South? That there's a division between black and white. If that's not enough, there's a division between the wealthy and the poor. And based on what you have and what you don't have, oftentimes what we do is say, hey, you have wronged me, so you need to do your job and then fix this for me. And the more that we do that, we cause more and more division. But what God wants to do is help us understand and saying enough is enough and enough is enough, not based on us saying what, who's right and who's wrong. Enough is enough is when we actually realize as the people of God to discern who's spiritually alive and who's spiritually dead. That's what reconciliation is all about, my friends, because as we as the people of God are spiritually alive, we are the ones who actually help recognize when someone is spiritually dead. Because this is why some of us in the church can be of wealth, some of us can be of not. This is why in the church some of us can be black, some of us can't be. Some of us can come in here coming from a different region into the south. The reason why is because Jesus Christ himself is alive and he sits on the throne and his spirit lives in us. But the issue is too many folks in the church have allowed the culture around us to define us rather than allowing almighty God be alive in us. All I want to say to you this morning is, church, can we wake up to the reality that your identity is not defined by your race? It's not defined by Fox News and CNN. It's not defined by your wealth. It is defined by Almighty God because his spirit lives inside of you. Amen? Amen. Come on. Y'all already shot me down. Let me get into this. <laughs> but here's the reality. If we want to actually be ones who deserve who's alive and who's dead, there's three simple things that I want to give to you this morning. The first thing is this. We need to recognize that we are God's meeting place. I'll say it again. If you want to discern between who's spiritually alive and who's spiritually dead, we need to recognize that we are God's meeting place. Where does this come from? In verse 20 through 21, Paul says this, we implore you. Now, just a reminder, he's not speaking to the society of Corinth. He's speaking to the church in Corinth. He says, we implore you, we beg you on behalf of who? Christ. Be, everybody say be. Be, be reconciled to God. Reminder, you were separated. Jesus Christ brought you into reconciliation with him. What he's saying is be reconciled to him. Why? For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. 
so that in him we might what? Become the righteousness of God. Here's the most simple way that I can say it. In verse, in verse one, here's what Paul says. Paul says, for we know that if the tent, that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Can I tell you why this is important for us to understand? Is because our bodies is now the tent of God and we are now his meeting place. Do you remember what he said to Moses when the first tent was created in Exodus? He said, hey, I want to give you instruction to make a tent. Why? So that I may dwell with my people. But what's interesting is after Moses, he encounters David. And what does David say all throughout the Psalms? Oh, that I may be in the house of the Lord and dwell with you all the days of my life. He wants to meet with us, friends. But what's beautiful about what David says to God is, God, you've given me a house. I want to make you a house. So what does he say is, he says, God, I want to now make a temple, not just a tent. I want to make this beautiful building for you because of how good you've been for me. I want this place to be a place where your, your presence dwells. Fast forward into the New Testament, Jesus steps on the scene. And he's with all the religious folks and he sees this beautiful temple that David had built. And he comes on the scene to, as a succession of him and says, hey, tear this building down and I'll raise it up in three days. And as soon as he says that I'll raise it up in three days, they look at him like he's crazy. They said, hey, it took us 46 years to build this temple. Translation, Jesus was commuting to them. My body is the one that's actually going to resurrect. And my church body is now going to resurrect when I, my spirit falls inside of them. And once my spirit comes inside of them, they will be this representation of me. Here's why I bring this up to you this morning, church. Do you recognize that your body is a place where God wants to meet with you? Because what oftentimes happens, we think that the church building is the only place that God wants to meet with us. So we show up on a Sunday morning, we raise our hands and we sing and our kids are reading Ecclesiastes like over here. I'm blown away at what God's doing in the kids in this church. But at the same time, do you know that he wants to meet with you when you get back into your home? Do you know that he wants to meet with you when you get back into your workspace tomorrow? When you walk into your classroom that God continually wants to meet with you the same way that he met with you here? What's happening for far too long in the South, I'm glad y'all are here, by the way, for far too long in the South, we only see this church building as the place where God wants to meet with us. And God says, I reject that. Your body is my building. I want to meet with you every single day and every moment of your day. I don't know how you want to do it, but I can tell you how I do it. So the reminder for you this morning, uh, church, is simply this, that God wants to meet with you. I said this earlier, it popped up on the wall. I didn't even know it. God in blank meat. <laughs> I didn't know that was on the wall before I wrote this sermon. The Holy Spirit did. This is for you, studio, just as much as it is for me. Can I just ask you a simple question? How often do you meet with God? Do you know that your body is a place that he wants to meet with you? If not, can I just give you a simple reminder this morning? This is why we don't worry about our race. This is why we can walk in confidence. No matter what the society may say about our bodies, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, and that's enough for him. Amen? Amen. Let me see if there's anything else that I want to say here to you this morning. Simple question. Do you make time in your day to meet with God? Do you make time in your day to meet with God? If it's been a while, maybe today is a good time to start up again. This is his grace for you. Am I talking to anybody this morning? It just got quiet. I don't know if it's bad or good. I don't know. If you don't know where to start, just simply ask him, God, how often would you like to meet with me? And where would you like to meet with me? Can I just testify for myself personally? It's the first thing when I wake up. But I also work for a shift. <laughs> you may have second shift, third shift. It doesn't matter. Just ask God, hey, how, how often would you want to meet? Do you want me to sing to you? Is it just reading scripture? Is it prayer? Like, let God reignite the thing that he's put on the inside of you to meet with him. Amen. I'm not going to prescribe you with how to do it. I'm just saying you have to do it. Because if we don't meet with him, 
we won't understand that we have, we're called to do ministry for him, which is my second point. You not only need to meet with God, you need to understand we have a calling of ministry from God. We have a call of ministry from God. What does he say in verse 18 through 20? He says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Hold on now. Pastor Eric and Pastor Candace are the, past, are, are the ones who do the ministry. No, 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 no. Paul didn't say this. He didn't give any of us an excuse. He said he's given us, church, the ministry of reconciliation. Don't let that scare you. Let that empower you to the reality that God wants to do more through us than he wants to do with just the two of us. Do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples before he ascended into heaven? He says, hey, it's good for you that I go away because greater works are coming because I'm leaving. God will do greater things now when I go away through you as disciples. Do you remember this? And the gospel went from the nation of Israel to the, end of, uh, to the ends of the earth because God's spirit empowered his disciples to, on mission with ministry. Can I wake you up with the reality that God didn't call you to Greenville, South Carolina so that you can just be under the care of ministers and ministry. He called you here so that he can empower all of us that we are ministers of reconciliation. He didn't call you here just to show up on a Sunday morning. But here's the other thing that's beautiful about it. It says that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Now, that sounds good on paper and good to read. But a simple question, is there anyone in your life that you're holding your holding trespasses against them? That's the beginning of your ministry, friends. He says, say it again. I'll say it again. Oh, somebody's shoe just popped up here. (laughs) That's a first for me. I don't know where that came from. Oh, right here. Thank you, man. Listen, I'll say it again for you, brother. You want your shoe back or you want me to keep it? Okay, I'll keep it. Listen to this. In Christ, everybody say in Christ. Not in politics. Not in wealth. Not in church. In Christ. God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. The reason that people don't believe our message anymore is because it's not found in Christ. It's been found in politics. It's been found in race. It's been found in the things of this world. It's meant to be found in Christ Jesus alone. He is the ultimate reconciler. Can I get an amen, somebody? We have to wake up to this reality. It's in Christ. It's not in studio. It's not in your church. It's not in your job. It's not in your wealth. It's in Christ Jesus himself. Please wake up to the reality that the world is waiting on us as the church to represent Christ because this is what he also says. The message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for who? Christ. You're not representing your family line anymore. Sorry to tell you, you're not representing anything else but Christ. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. God has given us all the ministry of reconciliation, friends. I don't know how many of you love sports, but I do big time. Any lovers of sports in the room? Okay, my people, all right. My son is here, and he loves Steph Curry, all right? Uh, And so do I. Any Steph Curry fans in the room? Okay, my people, okay. I used to not like him, I'll be honest, only because Chris Paul and I are related, and Steph Curry used to beat Chris Paul all the time. So I hated Steph Curry. But God reconciled us together. All right, enough is enough. But here's here's what's interesting. Uh, The Olympics were on a couple months ago, and... Of course, my family, we go all out for the Olympics, mainly my wife. We make posters, we get T-shirts, we get hats, we go all out. These shoes are tripping me up. (laughs) We love the Olympics, all right? But what's interesting about the Olympics this year is there were two things that I really cared about. It was track and field and basketball. I really cared about track and field. I want to see what Noah Lyles was going to do. He talks a lot of junk. It is what it is. At the same time, Steph Curry 
and LeBron James and KD. I mean, I think they're better than the, never mind. We may create division. My bad, my bad, my bad. Enough is enough. Enough is enough. I don't want to come against anybody. But I had to see, is this basketball team better than the dream team? Like, okay. Okay. I had to watch it, okay? Let me just say that. If you don't, yeah, I'm going to be careful. Let me, another shoe here in a second. Thankfully, y'all aren't from South Carolina. Somebody would have already pulled out a pistol, like, you know, crazy. No, but what's crazy is watching the Olympics this year, I wanted to see what Steph Curry was going to do. Every time I turn on ESPN, it's Stephen A. Smith or somebody like, man, his shot didn't work and he isn't doing all this and that. And it's so crazy. I'm like, no, but I know who Steph Curry is. I know who he is. He maybe hadn't shown up yet, but when it comes to the, to the end of the day, that man is going to show up. And I kid you not, I'm watching, I'm watching. He ain't showed up yet. <laughs> His shot, it just ain't falling. But then when the championship came on the line, the game was at the very end. And it's like, is USA actually going to win? That man came out of nowhere shooting the ball, half court. I mean, he was making the craziest shots. And I'm running around the house with my shirt off, running around, (laughs) jumping over my kids, chest bumping my wife. And it's like, he's back, baby. God bless America. Yeah. (laughs) Side note, isn't it crazy how much Americans can come together for the Olympics and then divide as soon as it's over? <laughs> but listen, here's what's crazy about that. I had watched Steph do that since he was in college, and I was expecting him to do it. Why do I bring that up? The world is expecting the church to be the ones who minister to them based on what Christ has done on the inside of us. They've been waiting for it for hundreds and thousands of years in the United States of America. And it's up to us, church, to actually take this ministry to them. But we have to meet with God first so we can take it to them. They're expecting for a solution. You talk about this race issue. I mean, keep trying. It's not going to work. I'm like, can we wake up to the reality? It's not brain science. Like, it's simple. It's Jesus. Let's talk about the wealth. And we talk about all these policies. I'm like, man, don't find your identity in the policy. Find it in Christ and let that inform your policy. Am I going too far? Okay, okay, okay. I'm just saying we've got to do that. Please. Also, let the, oh, I didn't say this, but I need to say it because it's necessary. Do you know what's interesting about meeting with God in this piece of text that I find interesting is even... When I think back to the Old Testament and Moses was, is, is, is meeting with God, he's getting instruction. And what was happening below on the, underneath the surface where the people were too busy meeting with each other and they were strategizing and trying to figure out and they're like, hey, this is our God. And, and they made a golden calf down underneath the surface instead of being with God like Moses was. And that's where the first space that we actually saw deconstruction in the church so we act like it's a new thing. It is, this ain't a new thing. We've got people who are de- deconstructing their faith. You know why? Because they aren't meeting with God. They're meeting with each other too much. So what I'm saying is, I love the people of God. I love the coffee shops. I love the tea that you want to drink. But if you ain't meeting with God first, you won't know how to do ministry for God next. And we've got to learn, church, that we meet with God and then come down to meet with the people. Because if you start with the people, you will deconstruct. If you start with God, you will begin to instruct. Can I get an amen, somebody? I got pastor standing up now. He, look, she over here snapping her fingers. I like that. God is good. God is good. God is good. Let me get back to my notes, and I'm almost done. Also, if y'all haven't been to a black church, we go pretty long, all right? But I got to, and we ain't used to timers and stuff, you know what I mean? So like two hours later, kids are falling out. It is is what it is. (laughs) I've told you very simply, we are God's meeting place. We have a calling of ministry. Third and finally, we're given a new lens to see. This is what God does for us, friends. We're given a new lens to see. Why do I wear glasses? I, I need to actually see clearly. Here's what he says in verse 16, if you want to look at it in the text. He says, from now on, therefore, we, the church, 
regard no one according to the flesh. Wait, according to the flesh? We don't, we don't just know people according to the flesh? No, 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 no. Remember, it's all about spiritually alive and spiritually dead. <laughs> spiritually. Not what's on the outside, but on the inside. You remember in 1 Samuel, what he said? Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the what? The heart. That's what God is concerned about. Can we, church, be the people who are concerned about the heart more than we are about the Democrat or the Republican or the rich or the poor, the black or the white? Can we just look at the heart and say, hey, you need Jesus, not because of my policy, but because of his policy? Oh, if we would just live that way in the church, I'm telling you, revival would break out. The White House would become like the church house and almighty God himself would reign over the United States of America and create a power and create a freedom throughout the rest of the world. I genuinely believe that. Let's not start at these places. Let's let him start within us first. Please. Sorry if I went too far there. It got really quiet. My bad. If, what's your email, Pastor? I, if y'all got any issues, email him, okay? <laughs> but here's what he says. Listen to what Paul says. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Paul is saying, hey, I remember the stories about Jesus. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees is what he says to the church in Philippi. I remember only knowing him based on knowledge in my brain. I didn't know him by the power of what his spirit could do in my heart. And the scriptures say that when Paul met Jesus, that which like scales fell off of his eyes. And all I'm saying is I want people to see that like scale. I want to see physically that like that which like scales fall off of the eyes of folks in the community of Greenville, South Carolina. It's not going to come by us trying to win people over with our lips. It's going to come as we meet with God and let him do his work in us. And we understand that we are all ministers of reconciliation to take people who are divided and come united under the spirit of the living God. And in that place that we don't look at the outside of folks, but we see on the inside and recognize there's something off. And I'm here to introduce you to King Jesus. This is why forgiveness is so powerful. I like the way the old saint said it, that keeping bitterness and unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die from it. Yeah. It just doesn't work. How are you looking at folks around you? Do you see them through the eyes of Jesus? And if you don't, let them call you to repentance today. That's my simple invitation. When you look at the people around you, is there anyone that you don't even want to look at? Those are the folks that God wants you to pay attention to. The person that hurt you. And let's just be honest, most of them offend us and we, they didn't even know it. I don't know many people who just evenly do things to hurt us. It's often offense that people didn't even recognize. Is there someone that you need to look at with a new lens today? What would God do in you and through you if you were to change the way that you just simply looked at the flesh around you? Because let's just be honest, the sun rises on the good and the evil. Everyone is created in the image of God, but only a few are formed into his likeness through the spirit of God. But maybe he wants to use you to bring that reconciliation to the folks around you. Can I get an amen? Amen. And you just remember and think back to the ways of Jesus when he came to planet Earth. Do you remember Matthew, the tax collector? I mean, he betrayed his own people, the nation of Israel, and no one wanted to deal with tax collectors. Tax collectors and Jesus says, hey, come, follow me. Come, follow me. Remember Peter, just a fisherman? It's like, I'm a construction worker. Nobody cares about what it Come and follow me. You remember the Samaritan woman at the well? who had been married so many times and she was with another man at that, at that time. Do you remember that men shunned women in that time? But Jesus came and he, he met this Samaritan woman. He says, hey, I know what your fathers may have said to you, but I come on behalf of my father who is from heaven. And he supplies her needs spiritually and she has to go and tell everyone. I met this man who told me everything about my life. Can you imagine the change that would take place if we went with the lens of Jesus? Not looking at what was done in the past, but looking at the present and what the Holy Spirit wanted to do. 
What change would take place in our homes? What change would take place in our workplaces? What change would take place in the state of South Carolina? What change would take place in the United States of America? What change would take place all throughout the globe of people saying that the kingdom is come to earth as it is in heaven through Jesus and his disciples? That's us, friends. Oh, and then last and finally, you've got the Apostle Paul who knew Christ according to the flesh. But then Jesus met him. He went from killing Christians to then writing to Christians. What if there's someone in your life right now that God wants to reconcile to himself and then use them just like he wants to use you? If you want to be one who is reconciled to God and simply live a life of enough is enough, I want you to stand to your feet so that I can pray over you and bless you as we go on our way today. What an honor it has been for me to be with you today. Studio. God has great things in store for you. God has great things in store for this community. Let's be the people who walk around saying enough is enough according to flesh. We've come to impart the Holy Spirit because he first does it in us. Amen? Amen. If you want to receive, hold your hands out in a posture of receiving. I'm going to pray for you and bless you and allow Pastor Eric to come up and close us out.